The Taiping Rebellion was one of the deadliest wars in history that left 20 to 30 million dead. The rebellion started in 1851 and finally came to an end in 1863. After failing his fourth and final imperial examination, Hong Xichuan had a mental breakdown and finally read one of the Christian pamphlets distributed by reformed missionaries based in Hong Kong on recommendation by his cousin Rang Gan. Hong Shi Chuan began to study them and had an epiphany. The visions of five years earlier now made sense to him. The man in the black robes was God himself and the brother was Jesus, obviously. Who were the demons, you ask? The Manchus, of course. Among his first converts were his cousins Rang Gan and Fang, and a man named Yang Shu Ching, who claimed to occasionally be possessed by God himself, and when he was possessed by God, he could overrule Hong Shi Chuan. The religion grew very rapidly, with tens of thousands of converts, mainly from the somewhat oppressed Hakka ethnicity. In 1851, they rebelled and proclaimed the heavenly kingdom, and by 1853, they had captured Nanjing, the historical capital of China. They were also well on their way to capture Beijing, the capital of the Qing, which we now know was very lightly defended and stood no chance of defending against the heavenly kingdom. However, the Taiping generals assumed it was well defended, and because of their lack of experience fighting in the cold, they decided to wait until spring, which gave the Qing the time to reinforce and ultimately stopped the attack on the capital. In late 1853, Yang, who was now permanently speaking as God, began to clash with Hong and eventually tried to coup the country, but he was killed, together with 6,000 of his followers, by the kings Wei and Qing. After that incident, Wei attempted to take the throne himself with the support of General Qin, but they were stopped by Hong Shi Chuan's personal guard the only king left was General Shi Da Kai, who had no knowledge of the plot to coup the Heavenly Kingdom. But the paranoid Hong Shi Chuan had him exiled regardless. Despite his seeming unjustified exile, Shi Da Kai stayed loyal to the cause and took his army to keep attacking Qing forces in the name of the Heavenly Kingdom. And sometimes he assisted the Neon Rebellion that was happening at the same time. But then the question arises, what if the Heavenly Kingdom defeated the Qing? But how and when this happens will influence the future of the Kingdom very much. You can imagine how different of a ruler Hong Shi Chuan would have been if Beijing was captured in 1853. Or, what I'm really saying, if the Heavenly Kingdom won before the attempted coup by the Three Kings and before the reforms by Hong's cousin Rangan. That was a very different Hong Shi Chuan than near the end of the Taiping Rebellion. If there was a successful coup during or after the war, the kingdom would have imploded immediately. It wasn't just the king that was replaced, it was the brother of Jesus Christ that was couped by his own generals. That invalidates the entire religion and crushes any legitimacy the government had. It's not unfair to assume there was always going to be a coup and unrest in the heavenly kingdom without the purge of the powerful generals, but especially Yang. The other way the heavenly kingdom could have won was with a more supportive Britain and France. They wanted favorable trading rights and preferably a weak China. They were initially neutral with regards to the civil war, but a couple of incidents started changing Western attitudes in favor of the Qing. In 1859, the Taiping mistakenly fired on the ship of Lord Elgin, the British High Commissioner of China, barely missing Lord Elgin himself. This happened right after Hong Shi Chuan requested support and or arms from Lord Elgin, which may have influenced his decision to decline the, this request. Three years later, after the Taiping started losing, the British HMS encounter was shot at from the coast of Taiping held Ningbo, giving Britain a reason to fire back and invade. Ningbo was captured a couple of days later. Reports of massacres of civilians by the Taiping started swaying public opinion against them. But ironically, the civilians of Ningbo were massacred by Chinese forces under British command. 
after being left unharmed for years under the heavenly kingdom. In 1862, the combination of public opinion, favorable trading rights with the Qing, and the Cassis Belli against the Taiping all aligned so that there was nothing to lose and everything to gain from outright supporting the official Qing government. It took 11 years and the trade privileges gained by the Second Opium War to get the British to stop being neutral. I think it's not at all far-fetched to think the support could have gone to the Heavenly Kingdom, especially after Rangan's reforms, which opened up the country for international trade and further increased efficiency with the first railway network in China, which he commissioned. In this alternate 1859, upon his return to the Heavenly Kingdom, Rang Gan uses his contacts in Hong Kong to tell the British of his trade reforms and assures that all British and French interest in the cities they take will be respected. Rang Gan makes it clear he is not asking for military aid, but is only assuring British interests and mutual trade. Lord Elgin agrees to peace with the Heavenly Kingdom. Rang Gan urges his cousin to maintain friendly relations with the other rebellions that were happening in China and to reinstate General Shi Dakai as a reward for his continued loyalty to Hong Shichuan even while exiled. Now with one of his most talented generals back and guaranteed neutrality with the British, the Taiping generals meet in the capital to discuss a strategy to defeat the Qing. The plan is to expand to the north to cut China in half while the British and French are fighting the Second Opium War around Beijing. The plan is a major success, and by the end of 1860, Taiping forces reach Beijing, linking up with the Franco-British forces. Emboldened by the success of the Taiping offensive and the ease in which Franco-British forces were able to take the capital of the Qing, the British High Commissioner of China rejects Qing peace offers and marches deeper into Manchuria, the heart of the Qing dynasty. Aware of the uncertainty of victory, Rang Gan convinces Hong Shichuan to give in to any demand the British may have, even if it's unfavorable for the Heavenly Kingdom. In a panic, the Qing Emperor orders the defense of Manchuria. Shi Dakai, who always remained on friendly terms with the rebels in the West, negotiates their incorporation into the Heavenly Kingdom and takes advantage of the weakly defended southwest of the country. After 12 years of fighting, the civil war is over in 1863. The Heavenly Kingdom puts down the more stubborn rebels who kept fighting even after the collapse of the Qing against the Heavenly Kingdom. Hong Xichuan and Rangan reorganized China and send missionaries to all parts of the kingdom. Britain and France established colonies in the area around Beijing. Three years prior, Russia started expanding into Manchuria and forced the Qing to sign a treaty giving up East Manchuria. The Heavenly Kingdom would not be in a position to contest this after their victory in the Civil War, but they would feel threatened by the ever-expanding Russian Empire. In a way to counter Russia's influence in the Far East, they invade Korea to prevent them from coming under Russian influence. The industrialization and general westernization of China would have been almost identical to J Japan's modernization in our timeline. The main difference between the two is that when Japan was up to date with the West, they had weakened and underdeveloped neighbors to expand into. The Heavenly Kingdom does not have this. By the time they are fully modernized, there's nothing left to conquer. Any conflict with their neighbors will end in a massive war. As for Japan in this timeline, nothing really changes up until 1876, when they historically imposed a commercial treaty on Korea, which eventually ended with a war between Japan and China over influencing Korea in 1894. Of course, with Korea being fully incorporated into China, there's no ground for conflict between the two. Japan was forced to open up to international trade by America in 1853. They signed many unequal treaties with European countries which sparked a renewed sense of nationalism and hatred for the foreigners. This combined with a rapid and successful modernization caused a sense of invincibility among the leadership. That quite understandably cascaded into more unreasonable and ultra-nationalism with every diplomatic and military victory. But in this alternate universe it's different. Japan doesn't get trapped into this positive feedback loop 
where they get rewarded every time they become more aggressive. The modernization and increase in size of their military and navy doesn't stop however, because it wasn't initially built for expansion, but rather out of existential fear for the great powers and especially Russia. I would expect the Japanese to become quite paranoid after the annexation of Korea by the heavenly kingdom this would only become worse after they received reports of China's navy buildup, which was part of Rangan's reforms. Perhaps this causes Japan to focus more on their navy and less on their army. Assuming the leadership of the Heavenly Kingdom after the death of Huang Shichuan and Rangan doesn't mess up completely, the period from 1863 until 1914 would be a golden age for East Asia. Both China and Japan will be on par with Southern and Eastern Europe economically, only being outshined by the fully industrialized countries. The great powers would be aware of China's growing power, but I don't think they would have realized how much of a behemoth China has become. In 1914, China would not have an official alliance with the Central Powers. But much like our historical World War II Japan, they would have shared enemies. China would be looking at reconquering Eastern Manchuria and Beijing, as well as re-establishing tributaries over Indochina, as both the Ming and Qing dynasties used to have. Indochina at this time was of course a colony of France. This would make China a de facto ally of the Central Powers. Japan historically had pretty good relations with Britain at the time, and without the Russo-Japanese war, they would also likely have good relations with Russia, so Japan would side with the Antan to counter Chinese influence in the region. No Russo-Japanese war means Russia doesn't have a military defeat and likely no revolution in 1905. I could assume this means they won't reform their government and military, resulting in an even worse military performance and earlier revolution during World War I, but I think there were too many factors involved that I'm just going to assume Russia is exactly the same as in our timeline, except that they have another front to deal with. China is caught by surprise by the sudden dramatic events unfolding in Europe and decides to also mobilize, but wait until they are confident the central powers will win. Somewhere in the middle of 1915, China decides to invade East Manchuria, occupy parts of the Trans-Eurasian Railway north of Mongolia and invade British and French territories bordering China. The Entente was prepared for this scenario and decided it was not possible to focus on two fronts at once and did not bother defending their colonies in mainland China, but instead the combined Anglo-Japanese fleets blockade the entire coast of China and bar anyone from trading with China. The Japanese invade and occupy the Ryukyu Islands, Taiwan and Hainan. Russia tries to defend their valuable port of Vladivostok and is assisted with logistical support by Japan but is eventually overwhelmed by the sheer size of the Chinese army. China also invades French Indochina but they can't commit millions of men to that front due to the logistical nightmare that is the Vietnamese jungle. Despite the huge defensive advantage that the French garrison enjoyed, they too can't hold out. Even if they were to kill 10 Chinese soldiers for one Frenchman, the situation is hopeless. China does border British-controlled Burma, but that too is a humid jungle with no infrastructure, so China doesn't get far. The opposite of the Vietnamese jungle, but with similar supply issues, is the Siberian steppe. Mongolia and her steppe terrain was part of China, so there's no uninformed, overconfident offensive. The Chinese High Command simply ordered the occupation of the most strategic places in Siberia and Central Asia, like the railways and some towns, with the biggest force they can properly supply. The naval blockade would send the Chinese economy into crisis. This isn't the isolationist Ming or market-manipulating Qing. This was the heavenly kingdom whose economy was designed by free market capitalist Rangan. It made China one of the most prosperous countries in the world, but at the same time, this integration into the world economy was also a big weakness in scenarios like this. The Entente, despite losing to China on paper, still has bargaining power. China would probably try to negotiate a peace treaty that is slightly in favor of them, 
but as long as Germany isn't losing, they will try to get more out of it. I can see China invading Siam to increase the front with British Burma and invade Malaya in a way to gain more power in negotiations. They may fully occupy Malaya, but I see no way they can get through the jungle of Burma. The Chinese army is stuck and spends the next couple of years hoping for Germany to breach the lines. They don't budge during negotiations, especially after the defeat of Russia in early 1918. Russia's loss of the Far East is bad, but not catastrophic. It may cause the revolution to get more support earlier on, and thus sign the Brest-Litovsk Treaty earlier, but it won't cause Germany to defeat the Entente on the Western Front. After the armistice in November of 1918, China realizes they need to find a way out of the situation they are in. First hoping to gain all territories they occupy and get Hainan, Taiwan and Ryukyu back due to their advantageous position and war fatigue in Britain and France. Britain is not willing to let go of their trade route through Malaya and commits troops for the reconquest. The more experienced British army is able to retake Malaya and Burma and after months of fighting, a limited peace agreement is finally accepted. China retreats from Burma, Siam and Malaya, but is allowed to keep French Indochina and all French and British territories in China. Japan retreats from Hainan and Taiwan, but is allowed to keep the Ryukyu Islands. China is only allowed to keep the areas they lost to Russia in 1860, but they can't expand further into Siberia. When the Russian Civil War breaks out, China joins the side of the Whites, but heavily influences them to the point they become a mere vassal state of China. 